From Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 18, recorded on May 11, 2021. <laughs> It's a drag in yellow, and you are listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from Sacramento, California, Ori Lieberman. Hi, Vincent. How are you doing? All right. Your last, uh, your last twin in Sacramento, right? Yeah, last twin here, and uh, next twin I'll be in San Francisco. The big move. Very good. Also joining us from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hi, Vincent. Hi, everyone. Joining us from New York City, Timothy Chung. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Nice to be back. And from Nashville, Tennessee, Vivian Morrison. Hi, guys. And we have a guest today who is currently sitting in San Francisco, California, Mauro Costa Mattioli. Welcome to Twin. Thank you guys for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, good to have you. Um, normally you were at Baylor College of Medicine, but uh, you've been spending some time in San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. You're right. At UCSF. And well, we, we're very happy you're here today because you have a very cool paper from Cell that we'd like to talk about. And uh, But before we do that, I just want to hear a little bit about your history uh, like where this all started. You're from where again? I was born in Uruguay, in South America, uh, <laughs> in the 70s. Um, and, you know, I was born in the middle of a um, dictatorship. And, you know, when democracy was established, you know, there was a bloom of knowledge and, you know, and, and I was very driven by science. So I did my PhD, I did my bachelor there, and then I moved to France, mm -hmm. where I did my PhD in virology, as a matter of fact. And, and during the years, I learned a lot about your work. Of course, I was working in hepatitis A virus, which is the small uh, brother of the Picorna virus. It's the less interesting, I would say, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, I moved to Montreal, uh, and I joined the lab of Nahum Sonnenberg. And uh, originally started to work on viruses uh, naturally, but then I noticed it immediately that I have to develop a niche and I bet on neuroscience. And, and, and so since then I've been working in, in, in neuroscience. And in 2008, I, start, I started my lab at Baylor College of Medicine in, in Houston. I didn't know that. You, so that that's actually new to me that you started in viro, virology and then went to neuroscience. Oh. Um, it's funny. It was, we, we've gone from neuroscience into virology. There you go. <laughs> and I, Mara, I saw that you had a paper where you showed protein kinase R knockout improved memory and protein kinase R is a viral virally related kinase. So there is some crosstalk there. Well, this is, you know, it is, it's, 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 it's quite remarkable what happened because, you know, at the time we, the bet was looking in this target of PKR or protein kinase R, uh, that is sort of like a general uh, mechanism of translation and control. Uh, 15 years later, it became perhaps a more efficient way to enhance and erase erase memories and you can do it in single cell, glutamatergic neurons, inhibitory neurons. And actually there is uh, uh, at least five big pharma which are developing drugs to target this pathway which is called the integrated stress response. Uh, and one of them is today in clinical trials. So, you know, is yeah, people who have bet, say, Jason Kreb or ARC or whatever, but nothing of that has pan out in terms of, you know, cognitive enhancement. And, and sometimes, you know, this is the beauty of serendipity, right? That you just uh, discover things that, you know, obviously you were not even uh, looking for. I bet you ARC is still downstream of ISREB, though. We're, we're going to look at this. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's more to come. There's more stuff to come related to this. So we actually did a couple of your papers uh, on TWIM previously, this 
this autism microbiome link on two separate twins. So now we're happy to have you on twin, which is, I guess, where, uh, where this belongs. And let's talk about um, this cell paper, dissecting the contribution of host genetics and the microbiome in complex behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, it's, a, it's quite a nice introduction um, where you, you talk about this dichotomy between genetic inheritance and, and microbiome inheritance. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. So, you know, um, historically, when we think about a disorder of the brain, uh, naturally we think uh, about something that is dysfunctional in the brain. Perhaps the connections are not well done, the circuitries can be affected, lack of particular cell type or so on. But this, this fuel is, is, is totally brain focused. Uh, however, as you guys know, we are not only composed of, you know, cells or uh, genes, uh, but also we are composed of microbes, right? And we and others, we have shown that those microbes, they can contribute to a behavior in a very powerful way. Um, so, and in terms of behavior, uh, we know quite a bit about how some genes could affect the behavior, but we don't know how those genes talk to the microbes and, and you know, try to dissect that. I, we thought that was essentially very, very interesting because we can clearly in this paper that we just published dissociate a behavior which has a contribution of a mutation in the brain and also uh, how this mutation, presumably in the gut or in, or in, uh, in immune cells, could modulate the microbiome and then the microbiome feed back to the brain and regulate another, another behavior. So that was essentially what, what we wanted to study. That again, we were not looking for this, but essentially this is how the story was presented at the end. Right, and there's been a lot of sort of, um, I wouldn't say controversy, but but uh, there hasn't been a lot of good science showing, you know, whether the effects of the microbiome are directly on the brain or there's an intermediate step with, you know, for example, the immune system is uh, in, interpreting these changes and um and I think that's also an advantage of your of your system where you sort of were looking to see, you know, what the direct implications are. Yeah, as you know, people, there was a, there's a hype on the field and uh, there's a lot of uh, papers which I wouldn't claim uh, are of excellent quality, uh, but some are in which they are, we are trying to identify mechanistically how this is, this is taking place. Now, we are taking the, the innate complexity of biology. We are just not looking at the brain or just looking at the gut. We are looking at this entire connection, brain-gut, which is very difficult to understand and which has no very little. So we have some examples of, of what we believe how mechanistically the microbe is doing this, uh, but I think there's, there's, there's so much still to learn uh, from it. So, Maura, a key part of this paper is a mouse model uh, for neurodevelopmental disorders. So, can you tell us a little bit about that and why you picked that for this work? Yeah, so we'll tell you the story why we started to work on this. On the previous uh, episodes that uh, you guys have invited me, we have discovered this particular bacteria strain that is able to reverse the social deficits. Uh, uh, now in a variety of mouse models that this happens in Houston, but happens also in Europe, has, happens in Caltech. It's reproducible across multiple laboratories, which is very rewarding. Uh, and, and the way that we believe that this microbe is functioning is activating this vagal, vagus nerve, which connect the gut to the brain. This vagal nerve has connections to a particular brain area that produce a hormone which is called oxytocin, which is sort of the love hormone or the social hormone. And, and it, it, so, you know, if you were to give oxytocin to animals, you can promote their social behavior and so on. This mouse model uh, that you are referring, Vincent, 
is a model has a mutation in a protein which is called CNTP2. Uh, is a model that has a social deficiency in, in the animals. The kids has a, they have a variety of neurodevelopmental dysfunction, including social problems and, and hyperactivity. And, and we, we focus on this model because we knew that essentially uh, uh, our bacteria promote social behavior by enhancing oxytocin function. And in this animal, oxytocin function is, is impaired. And we ordered the animals, the wild type and the mutants from uh, Jackson, the isolated lines, and, and the, as advertised, those, social, those animals were socially impaired. And when we put these our bacteria, we reverse the behavior. I just happened to give a talk here in San Francisco uh, back in 2017. And I spoke with one investigator who told me, I don't believe anything what you're telling me. <laughs> Those animals, they have no social problems. I said, what? How come they, they have no social problems? So I called my postdoctoral fellow at the time, Shirley Buffington, and I asked her uh, how she was doing the experiment. And she was telling me that because we were treating it with this bacteria, she uh, uh, ordered the mice from Jackson, uh, you know, the wild types on one line and, and knock out separate lines. And then I said, but that's not the way that we do genetics, do your litter mates. So now when you do your litter mates, you have heads, moms and, and dad, uh, the social behavior disappear. Just basically those animals were socially normal. In both cases, they have hyperactivity phenotype, right? So the way that we are taught in the field, we say, okay, this is what we have to trust. But then uh, we thought, but, you know, when you have litter mates in the same cage, you have your knockouts and your wild type. So if your knockouts are missing something in their gut because they are cohabitated, maybe, maybe the wild types are providing their, their microbes. And this is how the entire story essentially develops. Wow, that's that's amazing. So this is what I love about having guests on, because you know, the backstory is sometimes more fascinating than the actual science. Mm -hmm. Where that was just a random remark someone said to you, right, at a, at a, at a talk, and then you go back and go like, oh, well, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, so we wouldn't. A priori, this is we we show that this bacteria is effective in our hands in like about six different models. That was the first model that we use, Jason. That was the first model that we use. But then when we, we keep doing experiments, oh my God, this could really be. And I think one, one of the more important things that this could explain perhaps why in some instances, the behaviors cannot be reproduced from one lab to another. Because in some other labs, you may have your litter mates together and now the phenotype is gone. And in some others, they don't, and the phenotype is revealed. Yeah. So uh, I think that people, hopefully in the future, uh, as a matter of fact, I cannot tell you because I am reviewing two papers, which are, <laughs> which I have, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, so this is happening. So this is, you have exactly the same that we found. Uh, other people have already discovered it. So I think this will become more common. And I anticipate that the same will happen for cancer viral infections, uh, Vincent, or any other conditions where essentially, uh, you know, you will find, as long as there's a contribution of the microbiome, uh, you will have to take into account how you and, do your... And not just the microbiome. I actually either saw this, there was this debate that just recently you know, started on Twitter about litter, litter effects. And we often, you know, do litter mate controls because we think that's going to be a better way of controlling all the variables, but we don't take into account the fact that uh, the litter mates in each cage are isolated from other litter mates and, and they're going to have different uh, other litters. And, and so the parental effects, the, the, is it a good mom? Is it a bad mom? All right. those things can affect variability between cages and, and we just never take that into account. Absolutely. And in our experiments, we try to take into account of all those variables. As a matter of fact, every single time that we do an experiment in my lab, we use free, free liters, right? Um, we, I have a debate, a constant debate with people reviewing my papers. When uh, I do an experiment with a genetic model of a disease, right? Where typically you have only one allele which is mutated. 
Uh, and then you go and you do the same experiment in the mouse when a leaf mutated, and you see barely nothing or very little, right? You need to get rid of the two alleles to see the phenotype. Right? This is common in many disorders. Uh, but they say you need to go and do it with the, you know, with the model that will represent the human. So then we have examples in which we do four experiments, four separate experiments, four different liters, and we said we, we show the phen we see the phenotype only in one. And I said, listen, you understand that if I use an heterozygous, let's say, or P10, I only see the phenotype that you are you want me to see in one of the experiments out of the four. Do you understand why I cannot use this model any longer? <laughs> so uh, this is a constant debate that I have with, we are using models and we are model a disease. And we, you know, all models are wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, it, but I think people need to understand that Perhaps some of us, what we're trying is to understand biology, not trying to find a cure of a disease with one paper. We're trying to understand biology, and, you know, models are not perfect. Sorry, sir. Sorry, Mauro. So for the benefit of the listener, I thought I'd quickly summarize the, the finding you have so far, which is... That would be good. That yeah, would be good. Which, is, which is... There is a well, well, somewhat established genetic model of autism, which is this CNT-NAP2 protein knockout. And in humans, when this protein, in human autism, they found an association of this protein being mutated in an autism disease phenotype. So you and others have decided to look into whether in a mouse model of this protein that's been knocked out, is their autistic behavior, as in social behavior, social deficit. And when you got mice from a supplier, a mouse supplier, you know, a mouse factory, so to speak, all these mice came to you and they actually do have social deficit. Um, so a listener might wonder, might wonder, how can you tell when a mouse is, has social deficit? Like, do they, do they interact less? Because in humans, you can tell by language, for example, language development deficit. And of course, mice don't speak to each other, although they do have some ultrasonic vocalization. So could you tell us a little bit about how you assess their social interaction? Yeah, so the, we, the, we do typically three, four different tests. The, the, you know, one of them is in which you just put two animals from the same genotype, same sex, that they have never seen each other to interact. And you know, when you put them to interact, they start to sniff each other, and you can essentially assess, measure, how much time those animals are interacting. Okay, this is one measure. The other task that we do is, we use, we, this has been popularized by uh, Shaki Crowley, which is called the free chamber social interaction task, where you have two cages, uh, two cups which are inverted, those are wire cages cups, and in one of them, you put a mouse, and on the other one, you put nothing. And you put your test mouse in the, in the middle, and if you are a mouse and if you are social, you will spend most of the time going towards the cup where there is a mouse. This is measured sociability. But then what we can do is we can put a new mouse in here. And now, you know, I, the way that I think about this is this guy already have heard all the gossips that are in town or in the city or in the town, right? And now we'll go and spend time with the new folk, folks, for at least for a little bit. And this is called social novelty. So in this paper, we measure all three uh, of those behaviors and we discover uh, supporting the work from uh, people at, at, at UCLA, Dan Geshwin, that those animals, they are socially impaired. In other words, they spend less time interacting between each other. They cannot distinguish between the mouse and the empty cup, or uh, they cannot distinguish between the new mouse and the old mouse. So so this happened with the CNTNAP2, this, this alphabet soup protein knockout. Um, uh, but these mice, as you said, they all come from the supplier. They have been kind of isolated by themselves for a very long time, so that when you compare them to wild type, they have this deficit. Um, but as you found, when you right after they they weaned, which is when they're separated from their mums and they can kind of be semi-independent, if you put them together, this social deficit actually went away. Um, is that correct? Those animals also they have an hyperactivity behavior, mm -hmm. 
Okay. Another, which, which is also seen in aut autistic children. They also are hyperactive, right? This is not one of the, the central features, but yes, there's a comorbidity with hyperactivity in some cases. Uh, but, so, but then when you breed them, you know, your heterozygous, when you breed them uh, in your facility, uh, now the hyperactivity behavior remains, uh, but the social behavior completely disappears. Mm. So then we say, oh, so could it be that there is a microbe or a bunch of microbes which are missing in the knockout? But when you have them, when you bring them together, you are together with your brothers, with your wild type and your mutant. So now the microbiome of the wild type will supply the missing, the missing microbiome. And this is essentially what we tested. We just look at the microbiomes and we found that the microbiome of the isolated lines were separated, were very different. But the microbiome of the animals, are, that are obviously because they're in the same cage, that they are together, they are much more similar, okay? So then we say, okay, let's do this. Let's take the animals which are separated and let's put it together. And when we did that, we were able to get rid of the social deficit. Let's do also a separation experiment. Let's take animals which are litter mates, they are together, which are socially normal, and let's separate them. And when we separate them, even in the first generation, we did it for, for two generations, but even in the first generation, we already see uh, a social deficiency in, in those animals. And then what Jason uh, uh, was alluding to, uh, a major component could be uh, mums. Mums, you know, they, they are from the separated parent, the separated line, that from the litter main line, they are different mothers, right? So maybe one of them is a good mother, the other one is a bad mother. So in order to uh, control for this, we took animals which are germ-free. They have no germs. Those animals are socially normal. And all we did is we transplanted different microbiomes from the isolated line and uh, from the together line. Remember the animals that they were the together line, the social behavior was normal. When you transplant the poop from those animals, you are able to reverse the social deficits. But if you transplant the poop from the CANAP2 coming from the isolated line that lacks some microbes, uh, now you fail to reverse the social deficit. So then you, there is no potential effect on MAM whatsoever because the only thing that you're doing is you're doing a shitty experiment, namely transplanting poop from the different, the different <laughs> groups. I think listeners might be grossed out by all the poop thing that we talk about, but funnily enough, this is actually how um, people, experimenters assess microbiome for both humans and also for mice is you, you kind of uh, put poop in a blender and you do this thing called a 16S ribosomal profiling, which gives you like all the different family of, of microbes that that is in in the poop and and also what is perhaps um important is that it is worth noting that mice do tend to eat their own poop um i don't know why but they do and that is one potential way of how the poops get transferred between mice as well so they just eat each other's poop absolutely so I have a quick question about um, the timing of the, these experiments. So the way I've thought about the microbiome in autism is that it controls neurodevelopment and that kind of the initial formation of the, the composition of the microbiome then lead, like uh, affects brain development that happens after birth in mice. And then, so your microbiome at birth could have long-term effects on behavior. Um, I think what you show pretty convincingly in this paper is that that's actually not the case, that if you mix litter mates at weaning or later on in life or correct the microbiome that you can actually have an active effect even if neurodevelopment is altered. So I was wondering how you think about that um, because clinically that's like a quite a therapeutically relevant question of knowing whether we need to treat kids very early or whether we can we can wait till later into adulthood. Yeah so <clears throat> in a sense uh, we uh, were taught that those were neurodevelopmental disorders, are, and I'm, I'm fully agree with you, and because those experiments have never been able to be done in humans yet, uh, um, we cannot answer that question in humans. But surprisingly enough, if you were to just take a fomar one, you know, a gene that is associated with fragile legs, uh, there was a moment that Jason, at least in his uh, chalk talk, he said that he would study 
um, so if you were to, is a gene that is uh, missing, uh, you know, there's a methylation pattern and now it's silenced in humans. We have animals that if you were to remove it from R1, they have a neurodevelopmental problems, at least behavior. If you were to turn the gene on, put the gene back, when the animal is adult, the behavior is restored to wild type. And the same happened with uh, the work that, uh, amazing work, I have to say, that my colleague at uh, Baylor College of Medicine, Huda Zogby, has done with uh, MCP2. So in mouse, if this were to be the case, you would have expected that if you were to turn the gene on very early in life, perhaps during development when this wiring is taking place, um, that would be the only moment, so the so-called critical window, where you will rescue the behavior. But for some reason, we are improving behavior also in adulthood. Now, if you take, just going back a bit more specific to our work, if you just were to take oxytocin and you were to deliver oxytocin intranasally in some of those models in the adult animal, you are able to improve the social deficits. Now, if you were to have a social deficit because half of your brain is missing, it's very unlikely that oxytocin or any other manipulation will have an effect whatsoever. So uh, in this particular case, what our bacteria is working in a very similar fashion that oxytocin does. That's why for us it was not so surprising that we come uh, at later time points and, and we can improve the, the social behavior because what the molecule is doing is providing that signal in the brain which is making a social experience salient. Actually, I would say rewarding. We have shown that if you were to put two animals to interact and we were to put electrodes in the brain, in a brain region that sends pleasure, those animals, normal animals, when they interact, those neurons fire in a similar fashion. And if they were to receive cocaine, uh, uh, methamphetamine, or any other drug of abuse. But those kind of two models, those animals that they are socially impaired, when they interact, those neurons, they don't fire. So I, we interpret this, that the reason why they are socially deficient, so why we are gonna have a conversation with you guys if this is not a, you know, a socially rewarding experience for me. I, I would do it if, you know, I would do it for a little bit, but if it's not rewarding, I would say, thank you guys, it's over. So I am want to interpret that for the, the animals, this is why they are not interacting. If we just put the bacteria back, now the circuit gets activated, and now you put an electron in those neurons and those neurons fire it like in the control animals. But I think it's important to stress to the audience that, you know, autism, it's this autism spectrum disorder. So there's many causes for the selective phenotypes that you see in, in humans. And that, and that varies, as you said, from, you know, severe intellectual disability where there's no language all the way to uh, high functioning. And so the key point that you make though, is that if the circuit is intact, so let's say the, all that the, that's missing is the, the trigger to activate the circuit like oxytocin, then you can imagine that you can reverse those phenotypes in an adult. But there's a lot of disorders and the fragile X syndrome is, is definitely one of them where I'm, I'm, I think there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, skepticism that you could reverse the phenotypes in an adult because the, the developmental, uh, wiring of those circuits is so abnormal. I mean, and we're talking about intellectual disability where again, a lot of most fragile X kids can't speak. So that's just to not, I don't want to give the audience this idea that you can just feed some bacteria to to kids and now they're suddenly going to be cured. Um, we don't want to say that, but we don't want to. We don't want to say. We don't want to say that. Um, uh, but I can tell you offline of a clinical trial which is going on with these bacteria, and and I have to say it's quite remarkable. It is quite remarkable with you know this new way of thinking, uh, the effect that could have. But you just hit. Uh, uh, the, the nail in the head. Uh, when you do a clinical trial with autism, you have such a diversity, right? And uh, so a priori, you already know that whatever you have is not going to be affected in all, in all cases. Uh, so that's the challenge 
that people will have in the field. In the mouse, it doesn't happen. We just take the kind of two models, you know, all the animals are essentially the same. Uh, but in humans, the challenge is, is, will be that. That said, I think that this uh, uh, provides a new way of thinking about a neurological disorder and a new way of thinking uh, in terms of the mechanism by which uh, you have, you know, the disorder, but also perhaps a way to treat it. What I find appealing about this, Jason, is that when you treat kids, you don't want to give them crap that's going to be toxic, right? So this is the major concern that you want to have to treat a neurodevelopmental disorder. And funny enough, uh, or rewarding enough, is that if you were to give the same bacteria that we are talking about to kids between two and six uh, years old, you have absolutely zero effect in terms of toxicity. Uh, a trial is coming out, the data are coming out, uh, you know, in terms of the behaviors that they, they tested. Uh, but you need to start with that. Uh, and I think this is sort of appealing, a new way to think about it because everyone was focusing on the brain. And now for some disorders, perhaps you may have a way to intervene using that circuitry, which is millinery, as I have to say, that those uh, microbes are using to absorb the circuits uh, in a good way, like viruses used to absorb, you know, uh, the host to be able to be translated or replicated. Now, the, the, this, these uh, uh, microbes, they, they are using this circuitry uh, to promote function. Yeah, it's very, you know, exactly. It's exciting. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the direct therapeutic translation here is um, really easy to see as opposed to like a lot of uh, papers where, you, you know, the translational aspect could happen 20 years from now. Um, but I think that another thing that you, that's exciting about what you discovered is the sort of chicken and egg problem where is it that uh, in autistic kids, is it that the GI tract issues that they have, and many autistic kids have GI tract issues, is that causative of the microbiome? And then you get, you know, a feedback loop versus the actual insult, the actual problem begins with a, a, a change in the microbiome. And that's why they have GI tract issues. And that's why they have uh, developmental uh, issues. And, and so it's fascinating that this, this genetic mouse line has somehow, you know, the defects in microbiome. And I, I wonder whether you know anything more about why they have this defect. So the, this, um, the way that I see it is evolution, selective pressure, right? Selective pressure can come from a change in the environment. In the case of a virus putting a neutralizing antibody that will change the population and make, say, create mutants and escape. In this particular case, in the case of diet, uh, you know, which is the most effective way to change the microbiome, uh, there's nutrients which are present and will favor some and, you know, and will defavor others. Uh, here you have a genetic mutation and when you have a somatic mutation, although, uh, the, um, the behavior that is manifested is brain related or you know neurological related. The mutation happens in every single cell of your body. Such you can have. Let me give you two hypothetical scenarios. One, you have this protein in enteric neurons, obviously, right? Because it's not all in the central nervous system, but also in the enteric nervous system. This could affect uh, uh, most notably how the gut contracts. So the gut contracts in a different way, food will be essentially processed differently. And now there's gonna be metabolites that's supposed to be there and not there. And now you have a selective pressure. Uh, this protein is also expressed in, in immune cells. So now you have a change in the immune system and changing the immune system might be another way to change the microbiome. So we are trying to pinpoint mechanistically how now the host is able, where the selective pressure comes from and how. Uh, we have some ideas, we need to build tools to, to answer this, 
but those are two possibilities that we are entertaining and we are doing experiments uh, related to this. So, I think what's, sorry, go, please go ahead, Vincent. So, Mauro, you had you did an experiment to show that uh, a lactobacillus species can rescue the social deficit. Can you tell us wh why you did that and how it's working? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the way that we end up with this is because in another model of, I don't want to say autism, of social dysfunction, let's put it this way, that was induced by obesity in the moms. This is in the first uh, episode that, that uh, you guys interviewed me for. We have a, the same thing. The all springs, they have social deficiency. They have a change in the microbial ecology. And uh, what we did is we sequenced deep and we wanted to identify what are the strains that were present or not present. And it turned out that the one that was mostly changed, reduced by more than tenfold, is what well, this bacteria strain is called Lactobacillus ruteri. that absolutely I have no idea whatsoever what this bacteria could do. Uh, for me, it could have been any, A, B, C, I didn't care, right? I mean, I came from virology, I didn't know anything about, <laughs> you know, those bacteria, right? Actually, I wanted, a, a, because I knew that it was microbial driven, and I wanted, I wanted this to be a phage, but sometimes, you know, <laughs> but anyhow. Um, so, uh, when this bacteria was missing, and when we put it back, we found that we were reversed, that we reversed the social deficit, a key factor came from a paper uh, prior to us from Susan Ehrman from MIT that she showed that in a wound healing experiment that if were, she were to give this bacteria, she will promote uh, wound healing in an oxytocin dependent manner. And then we say, oh my God, oxytocin is the social hormone. That might be the mechanism, right? So now we end up with this bacteria that we know that the travel the signal through the vagus because when we ablate the vagus, the signal doesn't get to the brain and the animals are not social. In this paper, uh, Vincent, we did a metabolomics, uh, an unbiased metabolomics to see what are the metabolites in the gut that they were present in the control animal, in the animal which are socially deficient, and in the animal which is socially deficient treated with the bacteria that their social behavior is completely normal. And we discovered that what differentiate these groups is a metabolite uh, which is called biopterin, uh, which is a cofactor of, you know, uh, of a bunch of neurotransmitters. And uh, if we were to block the ability of the cell to produce biopterin, now the bacteria doesn't work. And if we were to give biopterin to the animals in a bacteria-independent fashion, we are able to reverse the social deficit as well, indicating that the bacteria is either producing, I don't think so, but I haven't ruled it out, either producing biopterin hmm. or inducing the production of biopterin in the gut. We have some ideas where the cell types which are doing this, and now that signal we believe is traveling through the vagus nerve. We haven't demonstrated that, but we are, we are studying this. Uh, but the beauty of all this is that now we have a system in which we could potentially screen. The, the more fascinating question for me, I'm a molecular biologist, is I want to identify what the heck is in the genome of the bacteria that confers the bacteria the ability to do what it does. Hmm. So the bacteria has more than 2,200 2, uh, genes. Mutated one by one and do behavior, that's not the way to go. It's a pain <laughs> in the neck. We, we did uh, a similar approach that I, I wasn't greatly successful. Uh, but now we have an in vitro, using this model, we have an in vitro way that we can test now for bacteria that induce by opturing or not. Hmm. And super quickly, we can test, you know, uh, we have a collection of about 300 mutants. We are using phylogeny to compare common genes that will hopefully rescue, the, uh, induce by opturing and rescue the behavior and so on. Hmm. But I have to say, that that's what the field is lacking. 
the, the field is lacking to get to this very deep mechanistic understanding uh, that will provide confidence to the field, A, but B, may he provide also very specific uh, therapeutic options uh, that today we don't have. So yes, I agree with Jason. We shouldn't go to the supermarket and buy any whatever microbiome or um, probiotic believing that we have, you know, we will, we will improve the social deficits. But uh, we, we need more biology uh, before we do that. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, those experiments that you talked about where you take your isolated mice and then put them back together or, um, you know, have the mice together while types and knockouts and then separate them. What's the latency to the improvement or um, worsening of those social deficits? So we, so <clears throat> again, uh, I am forced to think about evolution. And it, we did the experiments of winning. And the reason why we do the experiments of winning because I believe that in those lab animals, uh, this is the evolutionary time where the microbiome became fragile. The reason why it became fragile is very simple. is because you're moving from milk to solid food. So that's right there, there's gonna be a change in the microbiome because you go from milk from mom to solid food. And that might also apply to humans, right? Because they're exactly. starting to eat solid foods and a larger variety of foods around the time when we might start seeing behavioral deficits in children. So then what we said is, because it's gonna be a change, uh, here we can intervene. The system will be fragile at that particular point. So let's intervene here. And when we do the experiments, right at winning, this is where we see the effect. In some other experiments that we have done in germ-free animals, if we were to do the experiments later in life, we don't see any effect. And how long do you have to wait before you do a behavioral assay and see that effect? We, so if you do it in weanlings at like 21 days? We keep them for about four or five weeks okay. together. Uh, and then we do the behavior of the animals. Now, the reason I'm asking this is because I... I wasn't familiar uh, with the abbreviation of this, you guys call it catnap or something like that, but it's Casper protein. Yeah. Um, and gene. sorry. Catnap two is the gene. The gene name. Okay. Um, and I'm familiar with Casper proteins in that they are markers of nodes of Ranvier. And so on either side of them, you're going to find myelin sheaths. And there's a body of papers that um, show that, social isolation of mice um, changes myelination in the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if, you know, those changes, changes that are going to be occurring because of changes in myelination aren't going to be super rapid. But mm -hmm. so I'm, that's why I was asking how long do you have to wait when you do these experiments to see a behavior? And is there any way that you're, um, that some of the some of the changes you're seeing have to do with alterations in myelination because there's also a body of literature on multiple sclerosis and the microbiome and yeah. how myelin and the microbiome interact. As I said, how the selective pressure is exerted into the community, we, we just don't know. So uh, just to go back to your point is it, if we, if we were to have the ability to put back kind of tool in say excitatory neurons of the brain, where the signal is coming from the brain and is regulating the gut or enteric neurons or immune cells or epithelial cells. If we were able to do that, we will have causal evidence that now this is the cell type which is inducing a change in the microbiome as a consequence of the lack of this particular protein. If these were to be neuronal, purely neuronal or enteric neurons driven, I think that your question become very, very pertinent. Uh, but still, we, we don't know how exactly this is, this is taking place. For some reason, uh, it's interesting that this bacteria in, in the community has been eliminated. I know that you will say, oh my God, now we have more autism because this bacteria has been eliminated. Popularity for Trump also has been, has uh, rise up, but this, that's not the reason why we have more autism. So no, all the associations can be, <laughs> sorry, I don't want to get political. Let's not go there. <laughs> but but, but uh, uh, 
Uh, all I am saying that if you were just to look in, in the population, this bacteria in humans has been present very early, you know, in the 1900s or so, even in natives. But it's very difficult to find it in, in, in our community. Uh, and, and there are two hypotheses there. One, there's one hypothesis put on paper, that is diet. Uh, diet, the change in diet, this has been eliminated. My hypothesis is the change in stress and, you know, and, and anxiety in the population. It's some of the things that we are testing which could be drivers. So this is now the brain controlling the gut. So instead of, you know, gut brain, now it's brain gut, because this, this is a bidirectional uh, thing. Uh, uh, but again, uh, you know, why has been eliminated? Why we have uh, specific species which are more susceptible? They say when you get older, that we lose a bunch of, of those guys, good guys, why we lose them? Uh, it's, it's not entirely clear. So Mara, you showed that, um you have this idea that the biopterin in the gut is traveling via the vagus, right? What is it doing once it gets to the brain? You, you have some ideas, I guess. Yeah, so if you were to stimulate the vagus, so, so when we are doing Vincent with our regard, I think it's super cool. I'm not sure whether it will be successful. The other screen that it came out with, uh, because I'm obsessed to identify the gene, uh, we are recording from the vagus uh, in live animals. So we have electrons in the vagus. And we have strains that they know that they have a positive effect and induced by optering. And so we are see whether we can decode a chemical, I call bacteria chemical, right? So a chemical uh, feature into an electric feature. So in other words, whether there's a particular pattern that can tell me a, a good bug from a bad bacteria, right? Um, if we were to stimulate the vagus, we know that this region will produce oxytocin. Uh, uh, gets fired up and, and release oxytocin. And the oxytocin, my colleague here at Stanford, uh, is Kupas in terms of, you know, he, this, uh, Rob Malenka, found that there are oxytocinergic projections from, it's called the paraventricular nuclei and the hypothalamus, to this reward area, which is called the ventral tegmental area. Uh, you remember I told you that when you interact, you have reward. Uh, so if you were to block, clip precisely that connection, now the animals are less social. And if you were to stimulate that connection, uh, the animals are, are, are more social. So uh, our mechanism is from the vagus, go to the uh, um, hypothalamus, where those oxytocin-producing neurons will be activated and will release oxytocin. Uh, uh, one area where they release that we have causal evidence, causal as a field, is this the, the ventral pigmentary area, which is the reward area. Um, how precisely from the vagus hmm. to uh, the paraventricular nuclear, the connection is direct or, in, or of indirect, we haven't mapped it uh, yet, but we are in the process. In fact, you showed that intranasal oxytocin will reverse the, the social deficit also, right? Right, and we did that uh, for two reasons. Because when we do those experiments in which we cut the vagus, mm -hmm. people say, oh my God, you cut the vagus, the animal is dead. <laughs> That's why you didn't rescue the yeah. behavior, right? Yeah. But then if you just take those animals with the vagus cut and you give them uh, um, intranasal oxytocin, now the behavior is reversed. So the animals, they have the ability uh, or the behavior can be reversed, but if you cut the vagus, you, you cannot do that. Now, uh, a question that I, perhaps some of you are asking, uh, why don't we just treat with oxytocin, right? Why should we bother with all this, right? Um, <laughs> or biopterin, uh, right? Or biopterin. So there are two, there are two reasons. Uh, I tell you first oxytocin, and then I go to biopterin. Okay. Oxytocin, when you give intranasally, you give like... Uh, several order of magnitude, the amount of oxytocin that you have in your body, uh, because it has to get, internationally, it has to get to the brain. Mm -hmm. And the effect is very transient. You know, if you were to give oxytocin uh, to kids, but also to animals, immediately after the, 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 the animals are socially impaired, you give them oxytocin, immediately after, now they become social, four hours later, <laughs> There is uh, social again, mm -hmm. 24 hours later, social again. You, so then you say, oh, Mauro, obviously 
let's give multiple dose. But because you are given such a massive amount of oxytocin, now you have internalization of receptors. And as a consequence, there's a moment that you can give yeah. as much as you can, but eventually the system is not responding. Okay? So that's the beauty of using the bacteria might be, or the advantage might be that you are producing, you're inducing the endogenous amount of oxytocin that presumably will be necessary for the system to function. In a similar fashion, uh, biopterin gets oxidated extremely quickly. If mm. you were to give exogenous biopterin, it gets oxidated very, very, very quickly. In other words, you know, it can be used. But if you were to use it, those are studies that I have that I haven't done. There are studies that are com they compare, uh, you know, how much oxidation of you have of biopterin endogenously induced versus exogenously added to the system. And endogenously produce the half-life increase, you know, several hours. So that gives the chance to the system to mm -hmm. work. So that okay. might be the advantage of using the bacteria vis-a-vis -vis of using the, you know, the individual uh, metabolites. Got it. Yeah, the, yeah, bacteria is like a drug that regrows itself. <laughs> A drug well, company won't like it, but, but well, people might. Know, it was funny because at the beginning, uh, when I was giving, uh, now perhaps you guys are more familiar with this and you say, oh, of course, uh, this is expected. But, you know, five years ago, when I was giving those talks, people were very reluctant to believe, uh, maybe a bunch of them are still are, which are actually law, uh, that, the, that a bacteria in the gut could modulate the brain. But the same people, they were convinced that if you were to use a nutrient, now the nutrient that you put in the gut, yes, will signal to the brain. Mm -hmm. And to me, in a sense, a bacteria, I think a virus is a way smarter than a bacteria. The bacteria ultimately is a bug which is full of chemicals. This is essentially what it is. There is no difference that <laughs> adding a chemical alone in the gut, that's just adding a bacteria. So uh, sometimes when I explain or having a dinner, I say, can you explain me the difference between these two? They don't, they, they cannot differentiate it, but they still say, yeah, but I still don't believe it. So okay, fine, don't believe it. Mauro, we, we did a paper on TWIM recently where they show oh. that influenza virus infection in the respiratory tract causes you to lose your appetite and that changes your gut microbiome which has implications for the viral infection in your lung. So it goes back and forth. Exactly. Yeah, and I was just gonna, was that, 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 that point you raise about evolution, I think is fascinating, that, you know, from a very non-translational uh, point of view, why these bugs um, use various systems to, you know, to help the, the organism that they're in. Mm. And this reward system is, that they're tapping into this reward system is amazing, right? That they're they're actually then ultimately changing the behavior of the of the animal, um, and, and I think we're seeing more and more examples of yeah. of microbes that could do that. So let me tell you two two things which I think are fascinating. One from an evolutionary perspective, and the other one is going to be a romantic one. Uh, so, so one of the first animals that have a, a nervous system is Hydra, has four cell types. Um, an hydra has sort of like uh, a spontaneous contractility movement. I mean, of course, this is like, you know, it's like a, a very simplified version of an intestine, which is in the water, you know, it, it doesn't do much, but that's the behavior that the bees has, okay? Uh, and surprisingly enough, uh, and this is, this is, this behavior is, is crucial for all osmo regulation, and then many other factors for hydra. If you were to remove the microbes, now you affect that behavior. So 500 million years ago, we already knew the microbes and neurons, they were talking to each other to modulate that behavior. But for the more romantic standpoint, what, what more interesting uh, uh, advantage or evolutionary advantage that a pathogen could have a pathogen that needs to be propagated in the population that promoting social behavior. So now the animal is promoting social behavior to promote essentially its, its replication. Mm -hmm. So of course we, we, cannot, we cannot prove that, uh, but I think 
evolutionary, it, it might make a little bit of sense to have microbes which are which are usurping again, hijacking now, because this is perhaps what they are doing. Hijacking that they're not doing a bad function of the system, they are promoting the good function of the system to their advantages. Actually, when I was for preparing for today's uh, twin, I was watching some video on germ-free mice, and apparently they not only do they have social deficit, germ-free mice are much lighter, they weigh much less than normal germ uh, microbiome mice, and that's because they lack a certain bacteroidetes that helps digest some of the carbohydrates. Hmm. And, and uh, so your gut microbiome actually helps you kind of um, get more calories out of your food. And then I was reading some of your old papers where you found that uh, a mouse, um, a mouse mum that's been fed on high fat diet actually give birth to offspring. Well, first of all, it affects the microbiome and it gives birth to offsprings that are much less social. And I was, look, I was thinking about that and, and I thought, well, perhaps the, the fat, actually, the fact that your diet is mainly now fat and doesn't have carbs means that your microbiome change and it affects, you know, the, perhaps some of the bacteria that is needed. And then I was thinking, well, evolutionary, um, one, of the, one of the organisms that has very little carb in the diet and is not very social are cats. They, they are obligate carnivores and they don't eat calves and they are probably the least social pets around. So I was just thinking maybe this is something to do with, you know, maybe my, your microbes in your gut actually is your sixth or maybe the seventh now, the seventh sense organ to tell you the quality of the food you have. And perhaps if you have a lot of fat in your diet, then you can afford to be antisocial because you're probably living in a, you know, a very, very rich environment that you can afford to be, you know, not, not be nice to your neighbors and, you know, scratch them and run away and stuff. That's so, some yeah. intense speculation. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, very interesting. And don't cats also, um, what is the name of that bacteria that they give to rodents so that the rodents uh, don't have fear or parasite or toxoplasma it's a okay, toxoplasma. parasite so yeah when you were talking more when you were saying you know it's like uh the bug is trying to in, uh increase your contacts it, it can spread itself it made me think of that parasite yeah we don't we don't know who's running the show anymore it, it's, mm -hmm. easy oh, it's all passive codes. it's all passive right except for us we, we we can we're sentient but the bacteria the viruses i think uh or you were going to say something before right no, no. All right, I thought I heard your voice. <laughs> well, I was just gonna—I was gonna say my cats are very social, so I don't know if they're. They yeah, I was gonna microbiome. say. Right. What are you feeding them, Maury? <laughs> A lot of Graham salmon crackers. from the table, yeah. So, Mar Mara, what fraction of autism would you expect if if you could? Would you expect to be related to the catnap gene? Let's put it that way. No, no, because we have shown that in other models, actually, in other models also work. So, if I, if I were to do uh, and we are discussing this. So there's a clinical trial that has been done in Italy already mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I just happen to know some of the outcome, the unofficial outcome. Um, uh, we are trying to uh, launch with colleagues from Stanford uh, uh, another trial in here. If I were to do it, uh, I will just go with people that have been already in trials for oxytocin. Mm. So in, in trials with oxytocin, you have responders and no responders. So you already, you already know this kid respond, this one didn't respond. So if I were to do the, if I were to have the ability to do a trial, I will do it this way. I will just go and select the good responders mm -hmm. uh, on every single possible trial that has been done with oxytocin. And I will do the trial with them. Now, the way that I see this, that sometimes happens very, very uh, um, frequently in biology. Everyone believed that th uh, this would be effective if, uh, say, Rutherai is not present in their gut of oxytocin is dysfunction. And the way that I want to think about this is I want to think about an engine of a car, an engine of a car of 1956, actually the car that I used to have when I was young for my dad. And so let's say you were to have a tire, which is not functioning very well. 
Um, obviously, if you change the tire, you fix the car. But if you were to put a BMW engine into this 1956 car, the car will go faster. And necessarily the reason why the car was going slower, the tire, is, is the reason which is you know, causing, causing the pathology. So here you have something that is affecting something which is fundamental for social interaction, namely the ability uh, to promote oxytocin. You know, if you were to remove oxytocin from mums in mice, uh, the, 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 the animals, they don't care of their offspring. But as, uh, as, so, as soon as you inject them oxytocin, now they go and they retrieve, they retrieve the, 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 the offsprings. And there's kids that they have carried mutations in oxytocin receptors that they have been associated with, with autism. So this is, uh, in molecular biology, we call it a, perhaps a master regulator uh, but of social behavior. Uh, and so far, the, there hasn't been anything that has been so generalizable uh, mechanism to promote social behavior than, than oxytocin. And this is what this bacteria is hitting. So perhaps you have something else which is causing you, but now you promote more oxytocin. Hmm. And now you increase, you change the engine of the car and you still might be able to, sure. to reverse it. But it's still, we don't know. It remains to be seen, uh, Vincent. Mm. Now, I, I can see many points where mutations might uh, cause autism phenotypes for sure, now that you've sorted out this. Yeah. Anything else, folks, before we say goodbye? I actually do have one more quick question. Yep. So if kids with autism have siblings, do they do better? And do you think that it's because of transfer of the microbiome or, I mean, it's hard to dissociate from just changes in socialization from having the sibling, but uh, you can imagine that that could be a kind of the, the uh, obvious human orthologue of the experiment that you've done here. Yeah. So um, uh, I grew up in a town, in a 6,000 people town <laughs> in the countryside. Uh, and as a kid, I'm not proud, but of course we touch food from cows and uh, we didn't wash our hands or we put it in our mouth. Um, in current society, those are the things that they don't happen. I mean, I don't think that siblings, they eat each other poop. Not that I know. At least my- Should be my brother. No. <laughs> <laughs> At least my twins, they don't, uh, that I know. Um, but, but again, I mean, um, as I pointed out, uh, this bacteria is not in the community, right? And if this were, if we just, uh, I hate to do that because we shouldn't generalize for humans, but if this were to be the case and you have a particular dysfunction in the brain, and uh, let's say oxytocin system is not working, but now let's say you were to eat each other, the poop from your brother, but your brother has not the bacteria. So you don't expect either that you will rescue the phenotype. Um, so yeah, but surprisingly enough though, there are people which I don't think that's the right way to go, but they do it. They, they do those poop transplants, right? And, mm -hmm. and they have those super poopers, they call it. I don't know what a super pooper is. Someone who poops a lot or, or I don't know. <laughs> what if you're the, you know, we can make so many jokes about this. We can, mm -hmm. we can do another episode about that. <laughs> Anyhow, and it works. It, it seems that, you know, uh, I believe that instead of uh, adding such a huge community that essentially you don't know what you have inside, I want to believe that in the future, uh, there must be a new generation of, you know, probiotics which will be more targeted either as a small community, synthetic community, or single species uh, that, that it could thrive uh, on, on, you know, on improving perhaps some of those behaviors. You know, you don't, you don't actually have to eat poop. You can just be in a non-hygienic environment. You know, before yeah. 1900, we had no sewers or toilets and kids got infected at birth with all, with all sorts of fecal uh, transmitted pathogens. And right. when we made sewers, then we delayed that. And that led to right. the emergence of polio, actually. So it just, Kids being dirty, uh, that could transfer. You know, the mice don't even eat, have to eat poop. They, they're in a cage full of it, and it just enough of it gets into them. You know, so this is this is great because I just 
I'm always so guilty for how infrequently I bathe my kids, <laughs> but this is great. I'm like, they're going to be perfect. Yeah, so they'll have they'll no problem, perfect. no social deficit. Scientifically justified. Yes. There you yes. Go. I'm going to go tell my husband right now. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, uh, Maura, that's a great story. I look forward to more. It's going to be just fascinating to see I this. Story. Amy, Amy will be on the episode, but uh, nice. I guess and, I would be... Amy's working, you know. <laughs> it's a full house here. So I should, Ori knows uh, Amy and uh, Moro. They, 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 he knows they're from the Sonnenberg Lab, uh, I presume. So that's the connection yeah. here. And, and Amy helped us to uh, to get you here. So Moro Costa Macelli from Berla College of Medicine, currently working at UCSF. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Moro. Great work. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Great seeing you all. Good to see you, Ross. Likewise. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Maybe you'll run into him, Ori. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, it would be really great to run into him. He's doing, I mean, he's doing cool work. Oh, that's that's yeah, a great story. I mean, I have always loved these series of stories from uh, his lab over the years that we kind of mentioned. It's just, I mean, can you imagine you make the right bacteria and it solves this problem? That would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah. sure. It shows the power of someone coming from a field, like being a molecular biologist and coming yeah. into a field of neuroscience and kind of just taking that way of thinking and, and looking at the same data in a different way is really powerful. Yeah, but to be fair, you know, few people thought bacteria would make such a difference in all fields, right? It's only when we started to do high throughput sequencing that we started to get it, right? It's just transforming yeah. everything. There's a lot of hype. I mean, there's definitely, I think that's why, you know, it's it's good to have really solid mechanistic insight into some of these uh, phenotypes because uh, without them, yeah. um, there's a lot of hype without a lot of uh, backing to them. And so this is this is good. Well, and there's, yeah. there's a, there's a ahead, huge Ari. commercial opportunity. I mean, oh, there, yeah. like there's, there's yeah. patents filed for all of these bacteria sure. and for all of these different treatment paradigms and as Mara was sharing, was clinical trial data that's not published yet. So who knows where this is going? And I think that time and data will come out to kind of guide us, but it's exciting. I've, uh, I've, even, heard, I've even heard about uh, uh, yeah. poop blending parties that people throw for, oh, for homemade microbiome <laughs> transfer. This is like the, the like freeze dry your placenta and oh, then yeah. like add it to your super superfood smoothie. But it's a bit well, much. See, that's the problem. It's un, <laughs> un, these are considered supplements, and so you can add them to any food, and yeah, it's yeah. not regulated. Yeah. <laughs> right? Did you guys know that you there's this thing called Viome now that is, uh, you, it's like it's like uh, 23andMe, you know, where you would send in your spit and then you would you know mm. have your DNA sequenced. Uh, you can do this for your gut now. You can it's send a in a sample. Fecal sample, so, yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll be identifying serial killers now through their gut microbiome. Now, there's <laughs> also one for your fecal virome. Uh, oh. You can send in poop and they'll tell you, they'll sequence all the virus uh, nucleic acids in your poop. And um, I don't know. Do you, what, would they, what would they do with it? Well, that's a good question because I get emails <laughs> all the time from people who are scared. I have this this virus, which is, you know, most of the RNA in my poop. What is it going to do to me? And it turns out. <laughs> Is it polio? That, no, it's not. <laughs> the most abundant fecal RNA virus in humans is pepper mild model virus, which is a virus of peppers, which everyone likes to eat, I suppose. And so it's there, it's harmless. It doesn't infect our cells. But uh, we have amazing. all kinds of plant and insect viral yeah. genomes in us. And I don't, yeah, I don't know what it's going to do to for you to sequence your fecal virome. It doesn't tell you very much. <laughs> Most of the viruses are not eukaryotic, they're not mammalian even, anyway. All right, that was a cool episode. Um, all right, let's wrap it up. Ori, by the way, um, you were on your way to uh, San Francisco, right? And what are you yes. going to be What are you going to be doing there? So I'm starting neurology residency in, uh, in June. Nice, University of California, San Francisco, right? Yes, sir. All right. Well, we'll yeah. when you when you find Ori missing, you'll know why he's uh, he's yeah. too I'll, busy. I'll be putting in orders and writing notes and trying not to kill people. <laughs> well, good, <laughs> good luck. luck. With, good luck with yeah. that, Ori. Uh, just give them my, just give them microbes. If it's a <laughs> if it's a brain disease, that's it. Solves everything. 
<laughs> um, should we just mention the listener poll really fast? Yes, please go ahead, Ori. So uh, uh, I guess we could have talked about this at the beginning also, but uh, for anyone who's still listening, um, <laughs> we'll post a, a link in the show notes um, to so you can fill out some information about how you listen to Twin, what you get from Twin, what you'd like to see us do on Twin, um, so we can better tailor these episodes uh, to you. Um, so please uh, check out that, that link in the show notes and uh, we'll try to tweet it out and, as well. And if you don't like it, too bad. <laughs> there are plenty of places that you can tell us that you don't like it in this poll. <laughs> All right. Ori Lieberman is soon to be at University of California, San Francisco. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, Vincent. Good to see you guys. This is great. Jason Shepard, University of Utah, Salt Lake City. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah, that was fun. Tim Chung is at the New York University School of Medicine. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, everyone. And Vivian Morrison is at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Thanks, Vivian. Yeah, thank you. It was really stimulating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. If you want to send us a question or a comment, twin at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, you can support us financially, microbe.tv slash twin twin you've been listening to this week in neuroscience thanks for joining us we'll see you next time 